to be taken care of is to be controlled. The welfare state and the regulatory state go hand in hand. You have a welfare state and a paternalistic state based on the same conception, the same altruist conception of human nature. That's that, my uh, mic on. That reminds me of a, of a connection to that very excellent point. You can't refuse to put on seat belts you will be told, because if you get into an accident, the government will have to take care of you. So every time they give you something, it's like the Godfather, I'm going to do you a favor, but maybe someday you'll have to do me a favor in return, if you remember that. So uh, the government aid comes with control, control and direction, even for the people who are not going to ask for that aid. The mere possibility that you would get sick and go to a hospital gives the government the right to tell you what to eat and how to live because the rest of us will have to pay for it if you go to the hospital. Adam, did you want to say something? Uh, I mean, Peter's point is, is an excellent connection, um, and, I, and I appreciate it because a lot of people often conflate the welfare state with the administrative state, and they don't understand that there actually are two separate parts of what the government does. And in fact, as just as an historical matter, the administrative state arose first. It began you know, with things like the Interstate Commerce Commission in the late 19th century, but it really began uh, with the creation of administrative agencies uh, when the capital P progressives, the, uh, the leftists who uh, began to take over our, our government and our culture, um, at the early 20th century um, began to create many of the uh, in initial agencies that exist or at least the predecessors to the agencies that we have now, the, the, the Federal Food and Drug Administ uh, Agency, um, the Federal Reserve and other types of agencies because their attitude was that we need to, in their, their words, quote, rationally plan and, and, and control the economy and the economic relationships. And then the modern welfare state, as we now know it, was really put into effect by FDR in the 1930s and the New Deal. Um, and you know, uh, people often also get confused about the administrative state, too, because uh, in the United States, at least, it's given very much the trappings of being a legal institution and being a, law, a body of law. Um, you know, in fact, there's a whole area called, of law that you can now study. I, I took a class in it, people, uh, people specialize in it, called administrative law. Um, and uh, um, and it, I think it's fundamentally important to recognize that at root, it is not law. Um, it is, the, the agencies do not operate in accord with anything that matches the procedural requirements of due process that one normally expects to receive in appearing in court. They do not operate on the principle that they are to protect individual rights, even though they use rhetoric that makes it sound like they are sometimes. And, um, and uh, it really is a return back to a, you know, a form of, of, of government control over people's lives that was represented in the English system by what was known as the, per, uh, the, the crown's prerogative. Um, the, you know, the crown had this kind of inherent discretionary authority to act in certain areas of the lives of its subjects. That reminds me of something. Uh, some of you maybe have read uh, Sumner. I think it's Sumner. Who was the guy who wrote The Man Versus the State? Spencer. Spencer. That, Herbert no. Spencer? No. Uh, and social static. Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer. Is that yeah. what you said? Yes. I thought you said Bentham. <laughs> Spencer, yes. He opened my eyes to the fact that there were incredible regulations in the 14th century in England. The, the towns would regulate how many windows you could have in your house. I. I had no idea. You tend to think of, well, the regulations came later, but it was regulations were always there. Then there was a brief period where we had freedom, and then the regulations closed in on us again. I wanted to ask you a question, Adam. Uh, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but it's said that the regulation spoken of in the Constitution 
uh, the power to regulate interstate commerce. The, the term regulate there meant regularize, not oversee and supervise. And mm -hmm. I have been unable to track that down. Do you have any knowledge of that? Yes, um, and in fact, I, I agree with that. Um, I believe um, the constitutional law scholar Randy Barnett uh, has, uh -huh. ha is um, a significant source of our understanding of this. Um, but I, other people were uh, talking about this and, and, and writing about it in other contexts. Another uh, very prominent legal historian, Philip Hamburger, um, who's a, a, a critic of the administrative state. Um, in fact, he just published a book called, I think it's, I think it's called, Is Administrative Law Law? And his answer is no. In fact, his whole thesis is exactly what I talked about, that it's the return back to this kind of kingly prerogative of the crown. Um, but that one finds in the historical record uh, court decisions where courts are referring to the common law as regulating people's lives. And, you, and sometimes those statements are highlighted or quoted by advocates for the administrative state to show that, oh, see, we've always had the administrative state. We've always had regulations. But the phrase regulate in those contexts meant something very different than what we mean now. It meant, as you said, to, uh, to make regular. And so the idea was that the, uh, the courts in protecting our natural rights to life, liberty, and property and securing der necessary derivative rights like our right to contract and due process, mm -hmm. that they were making regular all of our rights in civil society. So it was a notion of kind of equal protection. So mm -hmm. that they were making it possible for you to exercise your rights to property up into the point where someone else can have the equal protection to exercise their rights of their property at the same time and without, without infringing or interfering with each other. Now there were notions of regulating people's behavior as well. That term, so to regulate did have uh, also this kind of sense of someone stepping in and controlling your life and there were state activities, not at the federal government level because the federal government didn't have the power to create an administrative state um, in the Constitution, but at the state level they did, and they did create various agencies to, to regulate minor aspects of people's behaviors, and they would refer to that at times as regulation. And so you have to be very sensitive to the context in which a particular term is being used because it it's represents two very different concepts. Well, you referred to the Interstate Commerce uh, Act. I think that was 1880? I think it was or the Sherman Act was well, 1880. The Sherman Act was 1890. The 1890. The antitrust. Okay. I think the Interstate Commerce Commission was set up in 18. Oh, it's been a long time since I studied constitutional uh -huh. law. Um, it's but it was probably eight, maybe 1870. I think. 1870. Yeah. I know Ayn Rand said the beginning of the end was the Sherman Act in 1890, and uh, I read the uh, the debate in Congress in the congressional record on the Sherman Act. And Sherman, Senator Sherman, made the argument that the trusts, which they were going after, have a kingly prerogative. And we've got to take that away. Inconsistent with our form of government, a kingly prerogative. So there's the equivocation between economic power and political power right back in 1890 in the Sherman Antitrust Act's author. Amazing. Uh, I have a question to throw you that I would like to see you wrestle with. It's a real paradox and I bet you've never thought about it. <laughs> the uh, point that was just made, that you just made, was that if under altruism, someone has to decide for the people because they're too incompetent to decide for themselves and you're giving them stuff, okay. But that it works the other way too, which is if you are the servant of someone, you have to adopt his standards, you can't impose your standards on him because he is your master. You know, that point, like Gail Wynand had to be the voice of the public because the public uh, was that which he served. And under altruism, you're the servant of other people. And the servant can't question the master's demand. So if the master says, get me heroin, you have to get him heroin. So how does it both allow 
control of, of the masses and serving the masses. You mean... Altruism. But who is the servant? You mean the government, government is the yeah. servant? <laughs> government is not the servant. <laughs> government, first of all, I spend my life wrestling with paradoxes. <laughs> <laughs> Who won? <laughs> <laughs> Under altruism, you are a servant of society. Who's society? Who represents society? The government. So the government is your master and the government can tell you what to do. And take it further. Here's another paradox, which you may not have wrestled with. <laughs> How is it that the advocates of regulation say, you're not competent to decide what's best for you, but you're competent to elect the people who will tell you what's best for you. Somehow the, the elected officials are able to know what's best for you and you're not. Why? Well, it, that's a very consistent position. The altruists believe that the reason that you as an individual cannot make the right decisions for your life, the reason that they have to prohibit for example, predatory loans because people will just unthinkingly take out a loan, not trying to think, well, will I actually be able to repay this next week or next month? That's too far ahead for people to think, according to the altruist. So the government, society as represented by the government has to step in and say, we have to prohibit you from taking out these, quote, predatory loans for your own good. Why is it that the government officials are able to think and to know what's really good for you and plan long range? Because they are disinterested. You are acting in your self-interest. According to this, the, epistemologically, the altruist believes that self-interest is a cognitive barrier. If you're just acting selfishly, that means you're being overrun by your desire of the moment. You can't think what's gonna happen the day after tomorrow. All you see is this candy in front of you and you eat it. The government has to be your parent, has to be a paternalist influence and say, no, we're gonna take the candy away from you because we know in the long run it's gonna be bad for you. The entity that is able to be, quote, disinterested, the entity that is able to act selflessly, i.e. government in the name of society, is the entity that is deemed capable of deciding what is and isn't good for you. So that's two paradoxes we've answered. <laughs> and I think we should take questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any paradoxes to pose. <laughs> well, while, we're, while they're waiting to ask, I want to comment on uh, what Peter just said, which is a really significant point, um, and it shows the key importance of thinking in fundamentals, because typically the response to your question, Harry, that, that Peter began with, right, that, oh, the, the regulators, the government officials, they control you, and this is often a paradox that people um, raise, which is, well then, but we live in a democracy and they're supposed to act on the will of the people. If the will of people are too stupid, then how are they supposed to select the people to, to lead them? And typically, the conservative response is, well, that just shows you that they're elitist, or this shows you that they have this kind of anointed sense, or worse, that they say, it shows you that certainty and reason is, is the problem. And actually, no, it's not. It's the explanation that Peter gave that it's the it's actually it's the it's the theory of altruism that really explains it. The notion of one one is acting in one's own interest and one one is not, and what necessarily follows from that um, in our governmental institutions and our laws. Um, this this question is kind of for Adam Massoff. Um, mm -hmm. We. 
uh, we know regulations are kind of preemptive punishments or precautions uh, to like protect you supposedly, but can you give some examples of laws, legitimate laws? Some examples of legitimate laws. Uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of legitimate laws. <laughs> I hope there is. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, well, uh, do you mean like laws that seem like they're regulations, but they're legitimate? Because like the patent laws and the copyright laws are, are legitimate. Um, you know, laws that, that protect and secure uh, you against uh, other people committing torts or breaching their, your contracts with you are legitimate. Um, and those are typically identified as common law, is in the sense that they originally arose through court decisions. Um, but they're actually, many of them are now statutory. Um, so starting in the 20th century, 20th century, the many states started to codify the laws that had been, that had been uh, adopted by judges through the common law process just because they provided greater certainty and notice to people when you had actually the rules stated very clearly in a pu very easily publicly accessible uh, place like a like a statute book. Um, I don't know if that's if I'm answering your question. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess uh, I think you did. Yes. Are there any kind of regulations that do ever like protect? I don't know uh, that are legitimate. Are there any regulations? If there are, they shouldn't be called regulations. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Most, I mean, it's also, it's important to recognize that even regulations that seem like they're legitimate, like the regulatory authority that the Federal Trade Commission has to prohibit deceptive trade practice, which one might say, well, that's legitimate because you, you shouldn't have fraud in the marketplace. Well, it is when it's punished under the, uh, the valid laws that prohibit fraud, yeah. which long existed the Federal Trade Commission's authorization to go after these activities. Um, so to the extent that if there is a regulation that seems legitimate, um, it's typically because it's, it's, it's replicating in some way, shape or form, a pre-existing legitimate law. And then, but if then it's taking it out of that legitimate legal context and putting it into a context in which it's now going to be uh, uh, both defined and uh, and adjudicated and applied in a very arbit through very arbitrary processes. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, which is what you've actually seen at the FTC through their prohibition against deceptive trade practices. It's been completely then di divorced from traditional notions and, and, and I think legitimate notions of what it means to commit fraud as originally defined in the common law. And the, a case like for fraud would be brought into courts, right? Oh, yeah, well, that's, court. that's exactly where you would and bring the And a board, case a government board, does not have the protections for individual rights that a court does. Right, right. I mean, you don't have the same due process protections. Yeah. And, yes. Next. We have, a, we have a question from online. Okay. Dr. Binswanger, your presentation on regulation earlier today was titled, All Regulation is Overregulation. Would you agree that in the context of political philosophy, the concept of overregulation as such is invalid and should be dismissed. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not sure that anyone would call it a concept. It's, it's a description, you know. There's too much red tape in this field, right? It's too much regulation. It's too, it's too slow. We want the right amount of red tape. We want the right amount of forced stagnation. <laughs> So now we can take your question. So this goes to the topic of the, the so-called disinterested government bureaucrat, uh, a mythical creature, I guess. But um, you, you mentioned the, the paradox of how, how is it that uh, a fallen man, so to speak, is able to elect uh, a fallen leader who makes, I don't know, impeccable decisions or whatever. I was wondering if there's an epistemological uh, counterpart to this where the whole business of uh, reality itself, or, or maybe that's metaphysics, being, being split. So knowledge is unavailable to the common man who lives in this lower realm. Is, is, there, is there some connection between the two? Well, there's the same kind of error, perhaps? I, I'm going to speak to that, if you don't mind, um, and even if you do. There's Plato and there's Kant. Plato said the ordinary man is a hopeless fool and can't tell the, the good philosopher from the sophist, 
you know, who's just a trickster. And yet he thought philosophers should rule. Now that's a complete contradiction because how will anyone follow the true philosopher to let him rule if they're a bunch of fools? It's like makes herding cats seem easy uh, than getting the, uh, f the people to follow Plato uh, if they are seduced by people who offer them a rational philosophy. Um, now Kant goes Plato one better. He says, no, the society creates reality. Now he doesn't say that openly. He says the structure of man's consciousness creates the reality that he lives in. But we all have the same structure and that's how you tell if something is part of the structure of reality. Uh, sorry, the structure of man's mind is does everyone have it? And they talk about inner subjective testability. Do, does everyone agree to this? If so, it must be built into us. If so, that's as close to objective as we ever get. So this takes the form of the voters speak for the collective mind. The collective mind knows. No individual no, a voter knows. But society as a whole embodies the wisdom that the individual does not. So that's the Kantian twist on Plato and it offers a solution to the problem of how will you get the people to follow the, the truth when they can't see the truth. The only thing is that the cost of that solution is the Nazi concentration camps. So, so oh, a brief word. So they're switching the, the context. They're saying that a collective knowledge makes it objective, which is obviously a false assertion. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what Ayn Rand says in For the New Intellectual, that the, for Kant, the collectively subjective takes the place of the objective. And boy, that's an accurate, great formulation. Thank you. Hi. I'm not saying I agree with this, but I know that there are many companies, especially well-established companies, that actually openly support a certain amount of regulation because they claim that it makes transacting business predictable and regular and they know what's expected and so on and so forth. Can you comment on that? Uh, yeah. Um, it makes it regular and predictable as against what? As against regulations that change from day to day? Fine. You know, there's, the, it's, it, it's a false alternative you're presenting. The choice is not either we have regulations that every day there's a new commission issuing new rules and nobody knows in advance what it's going to be, or we have one supreme ruler, one supreme dictator who never changes, who tells you what you have to do and it makes your life predictable. Why do you have to choose between those two? Really, the, the true alternative is abolish these regulations, let people live lives in freedom, and reality will be their guide as to what is going to happen and how to conduct their, their affairs from day to day. Uh, rather than having to worry about what goes on in the minds of some regulator. So when you say businesses prefer regulation, it's, it, it, it's ridiculous for them to say we prefer it to what they should prefer, to the absence of regulation, to freedom. And that's what they should see as the alternative, not the false alternative that is implicit in what you're saying. I think there's another issue here, which is that they are reacting to the alternative of regulation versus unspecified threats of government action. So for instance, if you think of Bitcoin, uh, a lot of the companies that trade in Bitcoin want there to be a regulatory body because they're living under the threat of governments could illegalize it 
and different governments doing different illegalizations at any moment. So it's the known, the devil you know versus the devil that you don't. And freedom is not on the table. There's, there's another uh, way in which this is being framed, which is that, um, <clears throat> that it's regulation versus chaos. Um, that they think that without regulation, then what you have is blank out. And they think, oh, that means it's, it's freehold bar and we, no one will, there won't be any rules and no one will know what to do. And that's not the alternative. The alternative is the pre-existing rules on contract and property and tort that have existed for hundreds of years. Um, and in fact, this is a long-standing framing that has justified the regulatory state at the political and legal level. It's what justified zoning. When zoning first came into existence in the early 20th century, the zoning advocates pointed to doctrines that pre-existing doctrines like trespass and nuisance and said they were indeterminate and didn't provide guidance and they were stifling the ability of landowners to build factories and things of the sort. So this is why we have to preemptively have rational rules that people can build upon and, and, and direct their lives by. And, um, and they won the political and legal battle in 1924. The U.S. Supreme Court infamously says that zoning is constitutional in a split decision, um, which is a, a, a horrendous decision uh, known as Euclid. And, um, uh, and, and then that becomes the defining framework. So if you ask anyone, why do we need zoning today? They think it's because there'll be chaos. There'll be utter chaos. There'll be a factory spewing out toxic smoke right next to a home with two small kids in it, next to, next to a 7-Eleven selling Slurpees. <laughs> uh, and, and to them, that's, that, that's, that's the only alternative zoning. And no one can grasp this as a private citizen thinking of building a home there yeah. or building a factory there, but somehow government can. And, see this. and by the way, and it's completely historically false too. And I actually, I, I, um, I used to assign an article to my students. I just don't anymore because of lack of time. Uh, when we talk, when we cover zoning, that showed that actually, su surprise, surprise, individuals left to freedom and contract and property rights actually did rationally guide their behavior in towns and the development of of of, of uses. So that that. Neighborhoods were separated from commercial districts and separated from factories. And Houston has no zoning to this day. Mm -hmm. Thanks in part to the efforts of, uh, I think it was Dwayne Hick. Um, Jerry, are you here? Warren Ross and Brian Phillips, objectivists who led the campaign when they were going to reimpose zoning in Houston got it defeated. So uh, it, it's <laughs> thanks to us. You know, we have some small victories like that. Um, I, w I think we should take the next question. We have one from online. Okay. Can you recommend any resources and authors to learn more about how regulation in the healthcare sector stifles overall quality? Hmm. I can't, can you? Um, yeah, myself. Um, <laughs> I have a section in my book, it doesn't exactly address the point you're making, but there's a whole section on the FDA, a lot of which is annotated in the index, showing the drugs that the FDA has prohibited that are available elsewhere, that have saved lives elsewhere, and showing the, in small part, the damage and the, the, the injury and the lives lost by the FDA's actions against certain types of drugs. But uh, that's a small answer to your question. I have posts on it on HBL, but they're kind of a priori. They're kind of from first principles, let us say, about uh, what has to be the consequence of um, forbidding mass experimentation, which is the main, the main thing that the FDA strangles is that they prevent millions and millions of trials that people would be doing with drugs on their own, which, from which we get big data that would tell us a lot. 
and rocket us forward. Uh, now we can take that question. A big thank you to the three of you. Um, and I hope I'm not derailing the discussion by asking a question about Bernie Madoff. Uh, on a recent episode of HBTV, uh, Dr. Schwartz made mention of, uh, uh, or you had made mention. Um, oh, oh, he was my guest. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and, and Dr. Schwartz had made mention of the fact that uh, both Rourke and Madoff are, are selfish, but they approach it differently. Uh, could you elaborate on that? I could, but, I, uh, oh, we disagree on that. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, now I get the question. Somebody asked me that. First of all, it's Mr. I, I'm, I'm a, I, I don't have the exalted title of doctor. Uh, I never got a PhD, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> so my view is as follows. The, there's, a, there's a concept selfish. We're not talking about the full meaning of selfishness in the, as, as explained by the objectivist ethics. The concept of selfishness denotes a concern with your own life. What constitutes a concern, what constitutes a concern about your own interest how you're to achieve it, and, all, and whether it's good or bad, all of that is something that needs to be addressed by philosophy. It is not inherent in the term, in the concept itself. The concept itself arises because we see two very different types of behavior. We see one type of behavior where a person is uncaring about his own interest, someone willing to sacrifice for the sake of others, someone willing to suffer for the sake of others, let's say that's personified by Mother Teresa. So that's one type of behavior. Then we see a very different type of behavior. We see people who don't sacrifice for others, but people who care about bettering their own life by, in their own by their own lights. So a Bernie Madoff was a cheat and a crook. He did it in order to benefit himself. He wanted to have a nice house. He wanted to have nice cars. He wanted to have a swimming pool. He wanted to go vacation in Aspen. All of those things were done for his benefit. Now, in reality, they contradict his interests. By, in reality, I mean in the full philosophic context, if you understand what the long-term consequences are of the choices he made, they are not selfish in the true sense of the word, they're self-destructive. But they are motivated by a desire to improve his life, to benefit his life. As against the Mother Teresa's life, who, uh, Mother Teresa's behavior, which gives up repudiates the things that benefit her own life. Now, it's true that Madoff was evading. It's true that he did not really honestly sit down and say, well, what will actually benefit my life? If I'm engaged in this uh, Ponzi scheme, is that really going to help me in the long run? Or is it going to put me into conflict with reality every day where I have to keep manipulating reality and I have to build lie upon lie and I have to be anxious that someone will do All of that is why, in fact, he was acting self-destructively. But you can't know that except if you have a larger philosophic context that defines what does self-interest really mean, what does... What, how do you achieve it? What threatens it? it the, all of that comes later. What we have at first is simply the concept selfish as opposed to selfless to denote two very different types of behavior. And therefore, I think that it's, it's correct to say that Bernie Madoff falls in the category of selfish. Now, add one thing to that. I don't think that people who are patently 
uncaring and, and uh, um, indifferent to their welfare, those kinds of people do not fall in the category of selfish. So you have, let's say, a habitual a drug addict who takes cocaine all day or an alcoholic who lives in a constant state of stupor. That is not being selfish. That is outside. That, that person has given up his mind. That person has disconnected his actions from himself, in effect. There's no way for him to say, well, I'm going to uh, uh, stay in an alcoholic stupor 24 hours a day because that really benefits me. He has no concept of benefit. It's nothing to him. As against a, a crook who does do the things that he thinks will actually benefit him, will actually make his life better, will get him the, 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 you know, the nice house and the nice cars, even though in the long run he's acting to destroy himself. Well, I don't agree with that, but I'm not sure I'm right. Um, I think that this categorization would place actions into two bins, those that are done for the purpose of benefiting a, another and those that are not, even if they're not done for the purpose of benefiting you, but you just fall into them. And, I would, and that doesn't seem right to me, the, a negative concept of selfishness. I think selfishness requires not only that you want yourself to be the beneficiary of your action, but that you give some attention to that. And I would bet you anything that Bernie Madoff, for instance, fell into this. No one plans a Ponzi scheme from the beginning to operate the way he did because they are by nature, they have to blow up. You know that you can't, uh, you can't always find more people to, if you know how a Ponzi scheme works, you pay new in, uh, old investors out of the money that new investors think is earning an income. So when you get to a certain size, it's a pyramid scheme. You can't sustain it, and that's like obvious. So I would bet anything that Bernie Madoff found himself doing this and then was on a downward slide where he said, well, I can't stop because they'll find out, so I have to do it again. I don't think that he, you know, said, well, this is, uh, this is a good idea. I'll get rich this way, and I can't see any flaw in it. I don't think that's true. I think, so I'm taking your, I'm saying that Bernie Madoff was a junkie. Uh, even, if, even if you're correct about Bernie Madoff, that doesn't really address the, the fundamental question because you could certainly imagine other types of crooks who engage in things that don't necessarily have to fall down in, the, in, in and of themselves. You know, people, somebody robs a bank, uh, somebody uh, mugs a victim in the street. Um, the, are the, is the bank robber acting selfishly? Or is he, or, no, let's put it differently. Is the bank robber acting in an attempt to benefit himself? And I think the answer to that is yes, even though he's evading. In that sense, the, the junkie is acting to benefit well, himself. Right. So I, I think that it's too, there has to be a, a certain level of concern with getting it right. And I don't think that any criminal gives it that concern. I'm partly influenced by the criminal personality by Samenow and Yokelson, which uh, blows the lid off whatever you might think about criminals. Uh, they are very uh, wrapped up in thinking about how to commit crimes, but they are also completely detached from reality. Uh, Thank you. Okay, we should... We have one from them. online. Uh, oh, at, online? Okay. Uh, if there are no zoning laws or regulations that prevent a developer from creating neighborhoods that have rules that restrict ethnic or other occupancy restrictions such as age, what laws would restrict a developer from doing this? Nothing. I don't get the question. Well, um, as a preliminary matter, it's not zoning that prohibits racial discrimination. Actually, it's the development and evolution of 
the interpretation of the Constitution by the Supreme Court and the explicit uh, statutory prohibitions on racial discrimination yeah. that prohibit that. And a such wrongful, as, such as the fair wrongful housing, yeah, wrongful, statute. such as the Fair Housing Act. I'm just, yeah, I'm just describing it. It's that's not so. Zoning <clears throat> is is really specifically limited to, um, you know, the the use of a uh, the use of uh, of land or other types of assets in the way that such that they control what you can do with it, how, how, what you can do on it, what you can build, and things of this sort. They're use restrictions. Um, and those historically were dealt with through nuisance and trespass um, and easements and other types of, uh, of doctrines. And actually, the whole evolution of homeowners associations, uh, which begins in the late 19th century, actually is a rational response of individual homeowners getting together and saying, we can re rely on our property rights to contract with each other to mutually agree to restrict each other's properties in certain ways that will, over the long run, benefit our property. Um, <clears throat> and um, this is exactly what you would expect to see homeowners doing, and you see it in other contexts as well, like in New York City, the evolution of condo, condominium associations and other types of corporate forms where people are using their property rights within a pre-existing framework of property, contract, and tort to exercise their freedom to enter into agreements that are mutually benefiting with uh, benefiting themselves and the people that they're uh, entering their agreements with. But at the end of the day, it's not the government's job to prohibit racial discrimination. It's the government's job to prohibit force and a violation of individual rights. Um, <clears throat> and to the extent that people are engaging in that, they're using their property rights to engage in racial discrimination. Um, then, then you know, that, is not a, that is not a political problem, that is an ethical problem that they have. They're not violating anyone's direct rights in doing that since they're not initiating force against someone. They have an error of knowledge in how they're choosing to use their property. And to uh, start to create legal structures to address that is the same type of mistake of moving off of the standard of, of individual rights and the force principle, which you're then beginning to unleash government uh, force for all sorts of purposes that have nothing to do with the protection of individual rights. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. What laws prevent the homeowners from getting together and passing racially restrictive resolutions? The same laws that are going to prevent them from going to church. Going to church is irrational. Racial discrimination is irrational. Are you going to outlaw those? Adam? Uh, thank you for addressing the issue. I'm experiencing it personally because three of my prescriptions are for controlled substances. Uh, it's against the law to provide more than a, um, to provide a new refill unless I'm down to two days supply and this is, uh, there is no provision for travel. In other words, only the original pharmacy that received the prescription can provide it. So in two days, I may be unable to participate in this conference anymore because I'm going to be sick because I'm not going to be able to obtain the medications. So thank you for addressing the large problem of regulation. Um, I do have a specific question, uh, which is sometimes um, we have a very clever criminal who discovers how to perpetrate a new crime that has never been perpetrated before. Uh, I have in mind Carly Fiorina's destruction of Lucent and <laughs> Bell Labs by a fraudulent software contract, which was fraudulent in a way that had never been done before, and so there was no law covering it. Um, so the question should, is? The question is, should there be 
some kind of standing institution that can watch out for the discovery of new crimes and criminalize them before they are uh, brought to their destructive result? Um, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. And, um, it, and uh, I want to lay some groundwork first. So, there's, so the, the legal system that we have and that has developed, and it's developed very inductively over centuries, um, and that's a really key point about why our legal system is, has been so good. And, they, and so the legal system is actually quite sophisticated in addressing um, the types of concerns that you've raised, although um, they would still be not legitimate in the criminal context. So for instance, in, the pro in what we call the private law, as opposed to criminal laws is classified as a public law because it's the state acting against individuals. Private law is where individuals interact and then if there's a problem or a dispute, they go to a court for resolution. So private law is contracts, torts, property law, and, <clears throat> and public law is criminal law and now administrative law is combined with public law and constitutional law. And um, so in the private law context, what has long existed, and this existed even uh, hundreds of years ago in the, in, for criminal law, was a distinction between two types of legal systems that existed. One was called the law courts and one was called the equity courts. And, the, and these were actually separate legal systems in England and they were separate legal systems in the United States up until the late 19th century. And the function of the equity courts was exactly to do this, it was a recognition that prior court rulings and statutes sometimes um, could not address every conceivable situation. And if you could identify uh, you know, ways in which people had acted explicitly fraudulently, <laughs> Um, and, and so, for instance, in equity, you could bring a cause of action for what's called restitution, where someone had received uh, a benefit at your loss and was essentially a fraudulent act, but that there wasn't any specific pre-existing court ruling in private law or public law that covered it. And you could prove it, and you could get restitution. You could get compensation for it. And the evolution of equity was precisely because they recognized that legal rules and statutes can't cover every conceivable situation that you can predict because people develop and there's new ways that people evolve and new types of contractual relationships and technologies. By the way, this distinction was originally recognized by Aristotle. Um, and he, in fact, they got the very framing of law and equity from Aristotle. Um, and intellectual historians have, have identified this and drawn it back to um, his, his writings on law. And, um, <clears throat> But the criminal law, it's a very, it's a, that, since the criminal law involves a direct application of the force of the state on the individual, um, you, you raise really serious fundamental due process concerns um, uh, about an individual not knowing ahead of time and not being able to know ahead of time if something is illegal. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why um, criminal law becomes separated from contracts, property, and torts and becomes codified because they recognize that the requirements under rule of law and due process for people knowing ahead of time what's expected of them when the force of the state is being brought to bear on them, direct coercion, then you have higher standards and higher requirements for a concern that if there's a mistake here that it's great, much more damaging than if you have a mistaken judgment between, and a dispute between two people. And so, um, you, you know, so it's not really, you, you, it's, it, you raise, it raises these same concerns to say, well, we'll create a body to try to identify ahead of time what crimes might be, exist. Um, is that because, you know, that's the whole point. The way in, the people are able to engage in, in unexpected behavior typically is a result of new ways in which they can interact through technology and other types of developments in our economy. And by the way, I can't speak to the specific circumstance you talked about because I don't know the facts, and so I don't even know if what, she, if what Carly Fioroni did was, was as you characterized it, so I'm not, using, I'm not saying that I agree with that, but that you say, well, I can posit someone doing this, but, they're, but then they may have an explanation for it, they may have a defense, you don't know, there may be another reason for it that actually sounds legitimate, and this is why you have court trials. This is why, you know, the state can't just drag you off 
even if it's really clear that you committed murder. There has to be a trial where there's a presentation of evidence and the defendant gets to contest that evidence because uh, under very high standards, evidentiary standards and legal rules that are known beforehand about what is required of the state to prove that you actually committed this crime as a precondition for its exercising its force against you. Mm -hmm. Next. Did you want to say something, Peter? Mm -hmm. I have an interesting point. Mm -hmm. somewhat relates to that, but uh, for what it's worth. Uh, you know the distinction between the civil law and the criminal law. The criminal law punishes and you go to jail. The civil law compensates and you try to make the damaged party whole. W-H-O-L-E again. And uh, uh, criminal law requires conclusive evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, which means there are only unreasonable doubts left. So that's, that's conclusive. The civil law only requires a preponderance of evidence that, say, there's a dispute who owns this part of the, this tree that's near the property line of the, our two houses, right? And it's not clear where the property line is or what the terms of the agreement was that you got it on. So that only requires that there's more evidence for Joe than for Bill, and Joe gets it. Why is that? Why is there a different standard? And, you know, you think it's because punishment's very severe. You know, punishment is the state coming in and sending you to jail or killing you. But that's not the reason, I don't think. The reason is that in a civil dispute, it has to go to one side or the other. The tree has to end up being owned by Joe or by Bill. So all you need is more evidence on one side than the other. You can't just say, well, not guilty, and go on and look for some other uh, perpetrator. It, ha it has to be settled. It has to go one way or the other. So I think preponderance makes sense there. Is that something you've ever heard before? Or do I get the Nobel Prize for that? <laughs> no, that's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting point that... that, that the byproduct of a criminal action is, is, is a negative. It's, the, it's either you're not guilty or the negative of a person being taken away to prison or, or, or to death penalty, where the byproduct of a civil action is a positive that For you're, you're making. Other. In yeah. fact, in, remedy, in remedies law, now I teach remedies because it's a whole area of law by itself about you know, once you've proven some, someone liable, and we actually refer to it now as the, you want to put the plaintiff in their rightful position. And, mm -hmm. I, and I always like that, that a wrong has been committed against them, and, um, and you're making them whole by putting them in the position they would have been but for the wrong. And it's called the rightful position. There is a higher level of evidentiary uh, 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 requirements in, in civil law uh, cases that it called clear and convincing evidence. Clear but, what? Clear and convincing. So clear there's, and convincing. Yeah, so there's preponderance, but there's also a, a much higher one that's called clear and convincing, and that's used, for instance, like if you want to invalidate a patent, you, have to, you, you can only do so by clear and convincing evidence. Well, what happens if there isn't clear and convincing evidence? Then you don't invalidate it. So this is so a patent owner will sue someone for patent infringement, and, and, you can all, and then you always have two responses, which are the two classic responses, right? You know, a person who's, who's charged with murder, right? Their first, one, their first defense is, I didn't do it. And their second defense is, well, even if I did it, it was self-defense. <laughs> um, so in pat and this is kind of maps onto all lawsuits. So, defense, so in patent infringement cases, it's, I didn't infringe. But even if I did, your patent is invalid. So it doesn't matter because you don't have a right to bring a, 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 an infringement well, action against There you've got me. an onus of proof then thing. It's, then yeah. it becomes, and then you have to prove that claim that your patent is invalid by clear and convincing. Uh -huh. And if you, don't, if you fail the clear and convincing evidentiary hurdle, it doesn't matter, then the patent is valid. But there you've got a, a thing that stands unless it's overturned. Yeah. So yes. that wouldn't be like who owns this tree. As far well, as it, well, it would be in a certain context because the patent is, 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 is a positive and the business practice that's engaging in potentially is a positive. If the patent is invalid, then the business practice should continue. Mm -hmm. If the patent is valid, then that business practice, then the, bit, then the patent should be sustained and there should be a license agreement that will ultimately reach between the two parties, which is again another positive that will follow from the lawsuit. So I like right, that we'll talk about it offline. Yeah. Uh, next question. So in Supreme Court precedent, there was an era that I think many of us in this room might look upon favorably called the Lochner era, where the court actually invalidated laws and regulations on the basis that 
those laws and regulations invalidated people's property and contracting rights. And the Lochner case was a case where essentially a baker wanted to hire labor who wanted to work more than 60 hours uh, in the week. And the regulation says you can't do that. You can't have somebody work more than 60 hours, regardless of what the parties wanted. That era is dead and gone, as far as anyone can tell. And the ideas of property and contracting rights uh, seldom ever come up anymore in terms of protecting people's rights, at least at the Supreme Court level. There's been an interesting development that I'm curious to get your What's imp the question. The imp question is what's happened is people have turned to the First Amendment through the commercial speech. What's the document. question? Is there a concern about using the First Amendment to protect what we would typically call property rights um, instead of actually referring and fighting for the idea of property rights and contracting rights? Because that's what's happened uh, for the past 30 or so years. That's you. <laughs> uh, I, don't want, I don't want to monopolize, but I mean, if, but, um, well, so, exactly. So, I mean, as a matter of intellectual history, what happened was is that leftists began to break down and destroy property rights in this country, largely at the turn of the 20th century. Um, I like now living in a time where I have to say the turn of the century is the turn of the 20th century, not the turn of the last century. Um, and, um, and um, but they, but property rights do more than just give you the ability to stand on a piece of land with a shotgun and say, stay off. It gives you the ability to decide how you're going to live your life. It creates a sphere of liberty, you know, where you can decide what you're going to do with your objects and how it will serve your life and, and how you will flourish and how you'll interact with other people. And, um, and so they, the leftists want their cake and it too. They want some of the, the values that are reflected in what property secured but they don't want property because it reflects too many to the individual freedoms and, and, and protections that it also secures. So as they destroyed property, then legal lawyers started uh, turning to other, uh, other areas of the law to try to provide those similar, similar types of protections. And in fact, um, as a, my view on the matter is that it's not a coincidence that the right to privacy as a legal doctrine is pushed by the same uh, uh, political and legal progressives, capital P progressives, the leftists at the turn of the 20th century, while they were also destroying property because privacy got them this, this, some of the idea of protection of people's autonomy and respect for their persons and selves, what was actually up until that point all conceived of through a property framework. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a fascinating article by a legal scholar, John McInnes, where he, where he actually identified historically from the founding up through the 19th century how even the First Amendment, the right to free speech, was largely understood as a property, as a property through a property framework itself, that it was free speech within the context of your property, either your, your, yourself or on your property. Um, and so. Uh, as, so what you're identifying is exactly what's happening. It's that they're, it's again, it just, it, it's, it's a showing of how they're, they want their caking it too. They want some of the, some aspects of these issues of, of derivative benefits of what having property is in some contexts, but they also want to deny the underlying properties. So when they get rid of the property, they step in and try to provide the other aspects through other doctrines. When it's not really those, the function of those other doctrines to do that, nor is it uh, you know, a good use of those doctrines. It doesn't work there, and then you get proliferation of non-objective law in that context as they con create convoluted doctrine on top of convoluted doctrine. By the way, I don't mean to deny that the privacy is an illegitimate right. I just was trying to point out that it, it, it's an interesting historical and intellectual historical fact that how it arose from the same people who were attacking property that they were started to defend very strongly the right to privacy. In fact, the source of the right to privacy is Justice Brandeis, who is a leading leftist legal scholar and ultimately, ultimately justice in the US Supreme Court. Um, and, I, and from my, my perspective, I don't think that's a coincidence. Thanks. And here's a, a general point. Property rights eliminate even the motive for regulation that people have. There's so many issues that get resolved once you say, well, the owner of the property can set the conditions he wants, but the government can't. For instance, speed limits, nobody raised, you know, stoplights, nobody raised those as an issue for regulation. Isn't that proper regulation? Well, the streets and roads and everything should be private, and the owners should set the requirements. In the absence of owners, the Ayn Rand wrote in regard to how 
Berkeley University should administer its uh, rules, that the government has to stand in the place of the tax owner, a taxpayer, and, and make rules for the proper use of it. But it shouldn't be government property. All the roads should be private. Then they could set whatever rules they wanted. Uh, this question is primarily for Professor Mossoff, but anyone can answer it. Um, I'm, there's a lot of discussion that I'm, I'm aware of of um, how regulations negatively impact um, you know, people's lives in various domains. But one thing I'm curious about, um, if you can speak to perhaps in a general way with examples, is if and to what extent the expansion of regulatory and administrative law has deleterious effects for um, other parts of the law itself, such as criminal law or tort law, perhaps philosophically or in terms of um, developments of precedent and things like that? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, it's the, I'm sure you've heard the economic principle, bad money drives out good. Uh, bad law ultimately drives out good law. Um, you know, once you move off of the standard of individual rights and the force principle, um, you know, you are, in, and you're entering into the, pro, you know, arbitrary processes and, and, and substantively doctrines that are based upon illegitimate concepts like the consumer welfare or the public good. Um, those, will, those will spread throughout the legal system and you've seen that. Um, I think the earlier example that I gave, uh, how um, fraudulent behavior by, uh, by companies is now addressed through the Federal Trade Commission. It's now considered uh, part of its part of its regulatory authority uh, under the antitrust laws um, to address what would have would have been and historically has been addressed through the fraud through fraud laws. Now you still get some cases of fraud and things of that sort, but you know, but when if you have a problem with a company committing fraud against you as a, as their customer, the 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 primary agent the primary legal source of relief for you now is the FTC. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, here's, here's something that plays into that. Uh, the court system uh, has become so onerous that you can't really consider bringing a suit because that means two years of you know, lawyers mm -hmm. billing you and so forth, or defending yourself against the suit. Uh, I heard the statistic, this is another one of those things that you don't know if it's right, that by the end of the 40s, the longest murder trial that had ever been recorded was two days. And O.J., you know, took over a year. O.J. Simpson trial took over a year. But I heard that it, it seems yeah. inconceivable, but repeat it because rumors have to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, another, just qu very quickly, concrete examples in patent law. Patent law... Um, has historically been an incredibly good area of law. The, the statutes have been very good. The court decisions have been very good. Um, but you know, but in 2011, uh, Congress passed a, a new uh, statute uh, in the area called the American Vents Act, and it just it, it applied the administrative state to the patent system. So patents are, pri are pro have historically been treated as property rights and adjudicated in courts for disputes and having their validity resolved by judges. And now there is an agency, an, uh, an administrative tribunal, uh, three administrative patent judges, they're called, who hear, uh, who hear petitions uh, to cancel patents. And, they're, and, and, and at some points, they were canceling patents at rates of up to 80%. Um, under with you know with no due process protections and and no re, you know respect for kind of the basic uh, processes and rights that you have in court um, and they were even uh, stacking panels to reach preordained results that they wanted to mm. you know the dispute right now over packing the Supreme Court they were they've been doing that in the patent system at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for 11 years now. And, um, and getting away with it because it's patents no one really pays much attention to and it's highly abstruse and technical. Um, but there's, I mean, every area of law has been affected. And, and Harry would give a very good example too. Just the fact that lawsuits today have become so complex, so expensive and onerous and difficult is a byproduct of all of the bad laws that have been just proliferating. Thank you. Here's a paradox for you to wrestle with. <laughs> when I reject a regulation, a common response 
is an appeal to ignorance. We just don't know what the effect is going to be. For example, we can't get rid of travel restrictions because we don't know what the long-term effects of COVID are. So how come these people think they know enough to run my life, but don't know enough to avoid running my life? How come they think the burden of proof is on freedom, but not on controls? Well, I don't, they don't think that way. They, 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 don't think, <laughs> they don't think they need proof in order to validate the kinds of controls and regulations they want to impose. The whole idea behind regulation is you're, everyone here is a, is a three-year-old and they're the parents, so obviously we've got to make you eat your vegetables. Um, it's not... The, the, they regard the individual as incapable of knowing what is truly best for him. And part of this is that the, there's a long philosophic tradition about the incompetency of the human mind, and particularly in, in Hegel, where the you can't know what your interest is, you can't even know what your will is, your, it's the, the quote, the general will is what your will really is, is what your interests really are. The, this, the regulatory state depends a great deal on, the, on collectivism, on, on the repudiation of the individual, not just politically and morally, but metaphysically. The, the individual is nothing. The individual is a cog in this machine, just a, a, a cell in this social organism. And the social organism rules. So if, if you stand up and say, I know what's best, I know better than you what I need to, how I need to plan my travel or whatever, you're dismissed in the same way that a parent dismisses the two-year-old who says, I want my ice cream instead of my vegetables. And all this um, drumbeat to get out the vote, now it's true that in recent years the Democratic Party wants more votes because more of the lethargic uh, people would vote Democratic if you could get them to the polls. But Republican, that wasn't true in years past, and Republicans join in on it's important to vote, it's important that everybody vote. Do your duty as a citizen and vote. Why? Because the collective mind expressed in a big vote can't be wrong. I've seen columns where conservatives have said that. The wisdom of the people cannot err. And it's this primacy of consciousness of society, which is merely the philosophical reflection of the psychology of the second-hander, is enormously powerful. You have never seen, have you, anyone in public life say, well, don't vote if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you, never say, you know, if you're not sure, if you haven't thought it through, if it doesn't matter to you, stay home. And don't vote, and let the people who are serious vote. Why is that? I think it's second-handerism. We've got to have society speak. Vox populi, vox di. The voice of the people is the voice of God. Thank you. Uh, next. So the court is, has a long-standing tradition has been very useful. What are the problems of the court where judges get uh, favoritism, where, um, like in the South, where uh, there's a favoritism against certain races, or uh, the mafia in New York that are doing all these favors for their community and uh, bribe the judges to get things that they, that they want? What are the mechanisms for those type of problems. 
Well, the bill down, but go ahead. Yeah, well, very quickly, I mean, the, I mean uh, there is the impeachment process for judges who are corrupt or biased, and in fact, um, hundreds and hundreds of federal judges have been impeached uh, in this country over the years. People only think of impeachment applies to the president, but it applies to any, any government official. Um, and, um, and, there, and, and this is why there's the appellate process. Um, and in fact, during, in the 60s, um, this is why a lot of cases were taken out of state courts and put into federal courts. Uh, was because of the recognition that they could not get adequate relief for what were sometimes legitimate claims of violation of individual rights because people were being attacked and, and, and lynched and things of that sort. They had to take it to the federal courts because they could not get protection in the state courts. Um, this is you know, why you have our system of federalism with the federal government and the state, in the state system. It's why you have the, uh, the linear process of, of appeals um, but you know the concern that there might be corrupt judges or and 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 and, and uh, or biased judges. You know it's always the question though. And Peter, you put it great in the beginning. As compared to what, right? Because I mean, corruption is the norm in in, in the administrative state. Um, there, it, it's all political favoritism, right? The head of every political agency is appointed by. The president and does you know and in, in, in implements the policies of the president and they immediately, you know, immediately repeal all the rules that previously existed and implement new rules because those are the new rules under the new political power, and um, <clears throat> which by the way goes to the point earlier mentioned about how we need regulations for stability. It's like the last thing you have in the regulatory state is stability. Um, so I mean, the reality is is that is you know as an institution. You know the courts are incredibly stable, incredibly, and 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 have done an incredibly good job um, over hundreds of years in providing security and stability to people, and protecting their rights, and securing due process and equal protection of all rights. I th I think the problem of, to the extent that there is a problem of growing corruption, it's largely a product of non-objectivity, which is another element in regulatory in, in, in the regulatory state that is very destructive. If laws are non-objective, which most regulations that we're talking about are, it's enormously easy to influence administrative judges or even uh, court judges that are involved in a case. It's, an, it's very easy to influence them to favor one side or another because they're equally non-objective. Well, there's no, there's no objective, if there is no objective way to rule for one versus the other, it, one verdict versus another verdict, then these judges are much more susceptible to corruption. The way to eliminate things like bribery, whether it's of judges or of legislators or whatever, is that if you get rid of non-objectivity, if all laws are really objective, then this problem of, of bribery becomes minimal. Then you have to have a really crooked, dishonest person who is going to be susceptible to being bribed. That's not, but unfortunately, that's not the case today. Let's take the next question. Um, so starting in 1770, uh, not se the late 1700s when the Constitution came out, co uh, into present day, um, it seems like we, we started on the right track and then things got off track and now we have this regulatory state which is growing and growing and growing. If we were to have, hypothetically, uh, objectivists, you know, controlling the national government and th three quarters of state governments and we could re rewrite the constitution to prevent whatever loopholes pr caused this. I mean, what, what would you do legally um, to sort of sure up and prevent a regulatory state from forming? I mean, like what caused this and what could we do if we could actually seriously, you know, You can't cha do it through a constitution. Like you have to do it through philosophy because what killed the country was altruism. Yeah, all, all those objectivist politicians would be immediately voted out of office. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and, would be re and would be replaced with politicians who would undo everything immediately. And they would be able to undo it because they would be the processes and means to do it through the amendment process and changing laws. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, you have to have some protections for the least, uh, for the most vulnerable amongst us, right? <laughs> you have to have a social safety net, as Ronald Reagan introduced the term. And uh, you have to have a guaranteed minimum income through a negative income tax, as Milton Friedman introduced. So uh, watch out for your friends. I, I mean, in the, debates over, in the debates over the Bill of Rights, the people who were opposed to the Bill of Rights, um, you know, w they weren't opposed to the, to the protections that are represented now in the Bill of Rights. They were, they, were, they were opposed to it because they were worried that it would create a precedent that those were the only rights that would be protected. Right. Because they said, and their, their words were, the Constitution is just okay. a paper shield. It has you know, as much effectiveness as a piece of paper. It can be easily torn asunder if people choose to. And if you okay. establish a principle that, the, that these are just the rights that are protected, uh, James Madison's term, you create a negative pregnant, then everything else can be infringed, and you'll create a, a, uh, an expectation that the government can, in fact, do that. So the premise of my question is flawed. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, one word, triangulation. <laughs> Do you know what triangulation is? When uh, the second term of uh, the second congre the, the voting in, uh, after Clinton was elected went strongly to the right in rebellion against mainly Hillary's attempt to push that government left. So Bill Clinton triangulated, meaning he compromised and moved to the right. Okay, if you change people's ideas, the politicians will just jump on board. You won't even have to uh, replace them with new politicians. They will represent their constituencies because they want to stay in power. And that is kind of legitimate and kind of not. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you would be amazed at how fast things would change if you once got the spirit of the country on your side. Is there an online question before we... We have one more. Uh, a questioner wants to know if memes are copyright infringements. <laughs> I think this is directed towards Adam, who shares memes, I happen to know. Yes. <laughs> Lots of them, especially if they're Star Wars related or, uh, or Beagle related. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yes, uh, and the reason why this person is asking this, I, I suspect, is because um, there was recently, um, there's been some proposed reforms to our copyright system to provide better protections for copyrights in digital content. Um, as I'm sure you all are aware, everything on the internet means that it's free and you can copy it and just take it, right? Uh, <laughs> well, if you, le if you at least talk to anyone under the age of 20 or 25, they, they certainly think that. And, um, and, um, and these reforms were opposed by uh, a, a academics who are always anti-copyright and, and various uh, policy organizations who also happen to be always opposed to intellectual property and copyright, especially on the internet, like EFF and an organization called Public Knowledge and others. And they're always looking for the kind of the catchy way to fire up young people to, to then write in emails and, and oppose le reform and legislation. And they came up with this idea that, oh, well, memes then will be copyright infringement. And any time you create a meme, you're, you're infringing a copyright, and you'll be liable for hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of damages under the copyright statutes. And it's just, it's, it's not really, a, it's not a real concern or situation. Um, you know, that, you know, you're, you're the, 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 the point of copyright is the same as the point of patents, is that it's a property right system. So, um, and what that does is that means that the owner of it can make the decision about how the asset should be controlled or used by other people, especially in a commercial context. And so if, if a copyright, so it doesn't dictate that they have to approve of everything, and they can allow other people to use their property if they wish to do so. Um, an example that I often like to give is in patent law, the researchers who discovered the AIDS virus got a patent on it in 1984, and of course, you know, that completely stifled and prevented any development of medicines in response to AIDS, right? <laughs> um, that was the exact opposite, um, and it facilitated it, and one of the reasons why was because they said, we will exercise our property rights by saying anyone can use it, 
Um, we want this to be available to researchers. Owning it and making that public declaration as, a, as the owners of it is the ability to do that. Uh, George Lucas adopted the same uh, similar principle with respect to fan fiction and, and responses to Star Wars starting in the 1990s. He basically adopted the rule that you can do it unless I say no. So he didn't want like Star Wars pornography and things like that. Um, same, same way that Disney doesn't want uh, di you know, uh, Disney pornography. But, um, but then, so it's called an open licensing regime. So um, memes don't interfere with the underlying you know, expectation of, of, of royalties or income of the people that you're making the memes from. And it's one of the reasons why they don't step in and, and, and try to stop it. When they do, when they do interfere with what they think is the legitimacy of the work or the quality of the work, or it's, they do then shut it down. An example of that was, do you all remember the Hitler meme from about eight years ago? The scene from the Hitler movie, I think it was called The Bunker? Downfall. Downfall, yes, where they took that scene where he was just about the fall of Stalingrad and he's throwing his fit and they always, they, and they made up subtitles about him, you know, in a, throwing a fit about some development. Does, do you remember that? And this is a very popular meme. The, the, the actual, the, the people who own the copyright in the movie actually stepped in at one point and they said, you know, this is a really serious movie. This is, it was a, it's, it's an excellent movie. Um, and we don't want this meme to be, uh, to be in existence. And they, so they exercise their rights as copyright owners and, and, and that's why you don't see those memes anymore. But you shouldn't worry about making memes. <laughs> okay, we have, uh, let's do real short answers. Bang, bang, bang. Uh, shalom. So I'm a bit shalom. nervous. I'm, I hope it's going to make sense, this question. Uh, regulations involve forces. Most people are in favor of the usage of, of force in order to create order in society, to prevent the chaos we were talking about. They also claim that when Facebook applies restrictions over its users, it is using force. Um, why do they support real force, but they oppose this kind of fake force that we understand that is only like a, mm -hmm. a free trade details between uh, voluntary people. Um, so what's the role of these uh, fake key. forces companies can apply, and, uh, or private regulations I sometimes uh, call these forces, um, in creating order, and how do we make people understand that that well, is the role of it? The people who are in favor of controlling Facebook and, uh, and the other tech companies are not concerned really about force and preventing force and having government pr um, protect people against actual use of force. They want to control these entities, their status. They don't like what Facebook is doing. The conservatives don't like it because they say Facebook doesn't give them enough outlets for their views and favors the left. The left wants, excuse me, the, the, um, you know, the left wants to control these companies because they're big and they, they hate big companies and, and they represent capitalism. So it's not as though they're confused about what force really is. It's a rationalization. They want to control these entities. They say, they, they want to obviously blur and obliterate the distinction between economic power and political power. And therefore they say, look, th these companies are big, they have power over us, we're against too much power, let's shut them down. So the whole issue is to make clear to the public the distinction between economic power and political power and why Facebook is not exerting force, but these people are just status and want control. That was too long. No, that was fine. That was excellent. Okay, thank you. Yes. Going back a couple of questions to what could we fix in the Constitution, and while well, I totally agree with you, you know, if we had all these objectivists in political places, while I totally agree with you about changing the philosophy and all that, wouldn't um, disallowing the government from regulating interstate commerce be a big improvement? Yeah, but so would a lot of other things that you can't do. 
There's not a chance that you could stop them from regulating interstate commerce. It says in the Constitution they can regulate interstate commerce. Right, but if you change the Constitution in that way, because you Who, have 75... Me? <laughs> no, the 75% of all the government officials are now objectivists. And so what, how are yeah. they going to change the Constitution? That was the question about three questions ago. Oh, you mean if we Ideally. change public opinion... I see. If we change public opinion, wouldn't you have to change the Constitution? Yeah, you'd have to amend it to make clear that regulating means regularize and not allow barriers. Just that was eliminate. their intent. Just yes. eliminate. Eliminate it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll yeah, eliminate, eliminate that clause. Yeah. Well, I, the reason why they put it in there was that ta uh, states were putting tariffs on goods from other states. So if you brought in something from Delaware into Maryland, you had to pay a tax like you do when you bring it in from France uh, today. And so they wanted to get rid of that. And uh, you, you, that's a historical anachronism. We could get rid of it. Yeah. There's a better way to get rid of it. I mean, I, in Atlas Shrugged, Diane Rand has Judge Narragansett striking what? out. In Atlas Shrugged, she has Judge Narragansett yeah. at the very end of the novel striking out the commerce. Well, she doesn't say the commerce clause. She says, redact, you know, striking out provi the mistaken provisions. And he's yeah. writing in a positive provision. provision. I think it says, uh, the state shall not interfere with the right of life, liberty, or property no, or no, contract no. or something. No, no, no. Freedom of production and trade. Freedom of production and trade, yes. I'm rewriting the Constitution myself over breakfast. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the hardest part is the preamble. <laughs> the rest of it is obvious. We'd love to read it when you do, Dr. I'll Vincent. publish well, it. Just, just, well, just like with Schoolhouse Rock, make sure it's something that we can sing to. <laughs> I didn't hear that, but... Just like what? Schoolhouse Rock. Yeah. Uh, I think we're almost at the end. Do we have time for one more online, or there's... A, Dan? Yes. Uh, Brian, Dr. Brian Simpson has written a book, actually. I just mentioned that to her. I just mentioned that. Okay, so it's called A Declaration <clears throat> and Constitution for a Free Society, Making the Declaration of Independence and U.S. Constitution Fully Consistent with the Protection of Individual Rights. So if you want to see a revised constitution and declaration, it's been done. <laughs> I'm doing At least oh, incidentally, somebody told me, again, you know, I function by rumor. Somebody told me that during the uh, 18th century, everybody wrote constitutions. It was like a hobby <laughs> that people in the different states would write different constitutions for their states because they were all interested, they were politically active, and they were all interested in getting it right. He compares so, his yeah, version to others, and he's the first objectivist I know who's done the entire yeah. thing. And I endorsed it on the back, by the way. Oh, okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> that means I shouldn't do it. <laughs> okay, Dan. Thank you very well, much for you. coming. I enjoyed it. See you around the campus. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.